Welcome to my course electrochemical energy storage and this is module number 4 where I am uh, describing the basic components in lithium ion batteries including the electrodes, electrolytes and collectors uh, to be specific. And in lecture number 17, we will be talking about the negative electrodes and particularly carbonaceous material, lithium titanium oxides and uh, other relevant uh, materials. So, the selection criteria of negative electrode that will be covered first, then uh, we will talk about the alloying anode and what are their uh, actual difficulties uh, that we will read capitulate once again. Then how to overcome that uh, in terms of 2D and uh, 1D uh, structural anode uh, that we will be talking about. Then silicon based anode that uh, uh, we will introduce and uh, metal oxide anode uh, also will be introduced and uh, at the end a case study of bismuth iron oxide uh, which I one of my earlier uh, lectures we uh, talked about. So, that we will also introduce. So, uh, this uh, already you know that uh, there is no point in indefinitely increasing the capacity of the anode, because if you do not increase the capacity of the cathode, then eventually will not uh, be benef benef it will not be beneficial for you, because it is basically two capacitor which are connected in series. So, it, if it is abnormally high and if it is low, then the total capacity will be lower than this, uh, uh, this particular uh, cap capacity of this particular electrode. Now, certain metal uh, uh, metals for alloy uh, that actually forms, that forms alloy with lithium and may act as anode that by this time you certainly know. Now, metal oxide can also uh, act as an anode material that also I have explained uh, in a form of a case study. Spinel type oxide that also can be used as anode, uh, lithium titanium oxide is another example. And uh, traditionally graphite uh, and uh, this MCMB carbonaceous material that actually commercially used as anode material. So, we will have a uh, look at different anode material that you are having for lithium ion batteries. Now, as a recapitulation, this alloy base anode has a problem of volume expansion and uh, that leads to pulverization and after many cycles, this will be disintegrated like this and uh, the structural integrity with the uh, electric uh, this current collector will not be uh, there and that is the major problem. Delamination uh, will take place and uh, once it delaminate after uh, many cycles, then that is also detrimental for the performance of the battery. Uh, it is uh, unavoidable at lower voltage potential to form this uh, ACI layer on the top of the surface of this active material. So, this uh, actually forms a disintegrated kind of uh, ACI layer and then after many cycle uh, it forms a some kind of uh, thicker ACI layer and if it is impervious to lithium ion then that is also a problem and this is related to uh, as you can understand the LUMO band and the Fermi energy level of the anode which I have explained several times in my earlier, earlier uh, part earlier lectures. Now, uh, let us consider uh, another uh, material which is not metal, but semiconducting in nature. So, silicon uh, is one of them. It has a huge potential as negative uh, um, electrode material. So, uh, uh, one uh, uh, deposited uh, a thinner about 250 nanometer film on copper current collector. And uh, it actually exhibited uh, relatively better cycler life than a micron thick film. Uh, but uh, if a film is thicker than a particular thickness, this 2D dimension film, then delamination uh, takes place, which is more detrimental 
then the form of island formation because there are two types of uh, difficulties that uh, uh, can be there uh, for this type of uh, anode. So, when lithium forms an alloy, then the first it will try to form uh, the island structure, not the continuous structure and that is part of this pulverization and then finally, it will be delaminated. So, even if it is pulverized, uh, still it is in contact uh, with the current collector. Uh, so, capacity fades, but it is not that uh, detrimental, but if it delaminates, then it loses contact with the current collector. So, that is more dangerous. So, in order to overcome, people have started to grow different types of structure. So, one of this kind of structure is uh, uh, in the form of a nanoware as you can see, this nanoware uh, is directly connected here with the current collector with the substrate and this is efficient for uh, the electron transport and there is a volume expansion that you cannot avoid, but you know that there is space available in between this. This is a structure, we call it a bristle structure, same like your toothbrush, the bristles. So, this structure is uh, effective uh, if you start to grow the silicon nanoware in smaller dimension with lots of gaps in between and it is firmly adhered with the current collector. So, this small diameter will not that easily break, uh, although the volume expansion will be there, the space will be filled up, uh, but it will still perform. So, this is one of the structure and uh, this has been experimentally verified and uh, they are, uh, therefore, people have started to think about the size effect, the effect of nanostructure in the size effect in uh, controlling the electrochemical properties of this material. So, if uh, a nanoparticle is synthesized, if the size is reduced considerably, uh, almost a zero dimension nanoparticles they are potentially competent with uh, advanced battery performance at low cost, since uh, they can be actually produced by various facile methods. So, it is not that cumbersome to grow the bristle like structure on a current collector. So, the uh, use of a micron size particle, uh, so that has a problem that will break into various small pieces and that basically will lead to the capacity loss. Now, if you have a very small particle, then uh, it is good for you, because uh, it will not have uh, uh, this kind of uh, severe uh, pulverization effect. So, breaking a smaller particle is very difficult. So, you take a piece of chalk, you can easily break it, take the broken part, try to break it, it is also, you will have to put more effort, but once it is very small, it is very difficult to break, but at the same time your specific surface area will start to increase and then there will be interaction with the electrolyte and that will form a CI layer, which is usually will be deposited on the surface and this SEI layer, if it is disintegrate, if it is not mechanically very strong or if it is impervious to lithium, then that is of no use, right. So, silicon nanoparticle can be fabricated on graphene sheet. So, this is uh, uh, the graphite and this graphite each uh, part the flake, if you take a single um, part it is uh, graphene and in fact, uh, the single sheet is uh, very difficult to get. So, there are multiple of this uh, sheets and then you this silicon nanoparticle they can be fabricated on this graphene sheet through the reduction of silicon dioxide particle with magnesium. So, if you reduce silicon dioxide with magnesium to form silicon nanoparticle and then embed it to the uh, graphene sheet and the size of this nanoparticle is in the range of 10 to 30 nanometer, so quite small. Then even if there is a volume expansion takes place, the stress will actually be buffered by this graphene layers, which are very strong. So, it is one of the configuration that you can think of, but the, the, the challenge is that such a small nanoparticle usually because of their 
high surface energy, they always try to form this kind of agglomerate. So, if it forms the agglomerate, then uh, this is not, this is something like a bigger particle, although the individual particle is in the nano range. So, disperse of this uh, in this kind of uh, situation in the, in between the graphene sheet that is uh, indeed challenging. So, this is one of the experimental evidence that has been taken from literature just to show that what exactly happens when the particle size is reduced. So, this is as you can see a pristine silicon which is 620 nanometer size and then once you lithiate it, it will form alloy uh, with this silicon, but uh, it will start to disintegrate. You see that it has been disintegrated smaller size. But once uh, you reduce the size to this level, 80 nanometer, then uh, as you can see that it increases with lithiation, the size indeed increases, but it is not that detrimental that it is completely pulverized and it is away delaminated from the current collector. So, that phase is not there if the size is reduced. So, if you just pictographically want to see that, then there is a size range here below that say uh, around 120 nanometer. Actually, we do not find any fracture. It will have a volume expansion from here to here, but there will be no fracture like you can see the larger particle size. So, fracture will not be there in this size range. Uh, the fracture will not be there in this size range, but if it is beyond a critical size, then crack will form and it will be disintegrated. So, the uh, thickness to diameter ratio is important. So, uh, as you can see that if the diameter uh, is increased here considerably, then this fracture is, uh, I mean you cannot avoid it. So, uh, uh, this is uh, one of the reason that uh, uh, this uh, type of material uh, one should have the process to grow, uh, a facile process to grow uh, in small dimension. And uh, usually uh, if the shell of this nanoparticle is in the size of in between uh, 150 to 2000, uh, usually they break during electrochemical test. By shell I means uh, if you see the earlier picture that nanoparticles will be slightly agglomerated. So, the size will grow like this, although the indi individual particle size is that low. That is also of no good because uh, this eventually will disintegrate uh, and that will not serve the purpose of a good uh, anode. Another process uh, that is called uh, hierarchical uh, bottom up approach where uh, you can have uh, uh, the silicon, um, although this process is uh, a bit uh, uh, complicated uh, for practical implication, but as a, uh, as a uh, laboratory study, um, academic interest, uh, one can do that, that uh, this uh, um, silicon is first coated on this kind of carbon black structure. So, as you can see by CVD it is coated, so it forms this kind of uh, CVD silicon coated on this structure. And subsequently, another carbon CVD coating is done on the silicon surface. So, on top of the surface, you grow uh, carbon layer film, uh, which is amorphous in nature uh, on the silicon surface. So, this carbon black particles um, forms a rigid spherical type of granules. So, in this type of structure, the amount of pore which is embedded in the structure that can accommodate the volume expansion while the connected uh, annealed carbon black could provide the efficient electron transport. So, here if the volume is expands, then this space which is there in between that will accommodate this uh, volume expansion and this uh, continuous growth of this uh, carbon uh, pathway that will lead to the electron transport. So, people have done it and uh, 
uh, you can see that about 1600 milliampere hour per grand capacity can be achieved without any capacity degradation up to 100 cycles. And also you can uh, uh, drain more current, so the rate performance is also quite good. So, at high discharge rate, this 1600, uh, as you know that if I increase the rate, then usually the capacity reduces. So, at higher rate also the capacity reduced, but it is still 1000 milliampere hour per gram. Another interesting uh, structure is a porous silicon composite. So, here what is done a mesoporous uh, silicon dioxide that is first reduced with manganese to form this uh, silicon, this red uh, balls there of silicon and this is formed in SiO2 matrix. And then finally, uh, this uh, matrix and this silicon they are coated with carbon layer. You can see this, uh, this is coated with uh, carbon layer uh, with a carbon coating and then with the hydrofluoric acid this SiO2 is eaten up, they are etched this this part, the blue part is etched. So, you get uh, the carbon um, uh, and, and this uh, silicon nanoparticles. So, lot of space is there uh, for the lithiation and the porous carbon layer is there for lithium to go in. So, this is one typical uh, uh, experimental uh, uh, TM picture where you can see this black particles there embedded in this uh, so called carbon nanotube. And uh, TEM uh, is showing that this structure is feasible. So, this is a silicon carbon uh, nanotube structure, the capacity is quite high because of the same principle that you have sufficient volume, so that the volume expansion can be taken care of. And simultaneously you have a carbon path, so that the electron can be transported. But because silicon itself is not electronically conducting, it is a semiconducting material. So, that also serves the purpose. Then uh, you know about the metal oxide anode, uh, where there are two step reaction. The first step if you take tin oxide, then the first step lithium uh, forms the tin particle in Li2O matrix and in the second step this tin forms alloy with lithium and this is embedded in the matrix of Li2O. So, you can calculate that owing to higher formula weight, the theoretical capacity will be little lower than pure metal. So, uh, because additionally this, uh, this oxide is having uh, more molecular weight, so capacity will be a bit re reduced. So, the factor that is needed to be considered for volume expansion uh, you need to do structural manipulation, nanoparticle formation because of the size effect that I showed. Nano rods is one uh, another structure, nano tube, hollow spheres, this kind of structure if you grow, then the volume expansion will be taken care of. Low electrical conductivity uh, that can be overcome by making composite binding tin oxide nanocrystal in graphene sheet by tin and uh, this nitrogen bonding in the graphene sheet that is beneficial or building conducting network tin oxide embedded in CNT that is also helpful. So, uh, as such the uh, this kind of approaches uh, uh, they are uh, conceptually it is okay, but uh, for making a practical battery still you have the choice of LTO and you have the choice for graphite rather than this fancy structures, uh, because it is uh, in small scale it is okay. It is easy to publish paper by making this kind of structures, but if you want to make uh, a commercial battery, then uh, uh, this type of fancy structure making in bulk quantity that is indeed challenging. So, another such challenge that uh, uh, was reported very recently from Rice University. They developed uh, a new lithium anode material and the concept remains same, the graphene nano ribbons uh, and uh, tin oxide. So, they are combining the tin oxide with uh, graphene nano ribbon and uh, they claim that the batteries made with this new material has double storage capacity 
compared to the conventional graphite anodes. So, they have increased the capacity due to obvious reason you are uh, introducing uh, tin oxide and uh, tin oxide we know that it will form Li2O and metallic tin particle and tin particle will form alloy with lithium and the volume expansion uh, will be grossly retarded because of the fact that uh, you can see there are a lot of space there in between and very small particle. And even if there is volume expansion, then graphene sheet that will actually uh, take care of that. So, this is another approach and uh, there are a lot of uh, 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 hue and cry for this type of new cathode uh, nanode material. But again, uh, scaling, scaling it up and use it in commercial battery that remains challenging. So, some typical approaches that is made copper nanowire arrays as collectors for direct and efficient electron transport of Fe 3 O 4 anode for lithium ion cell. And uh, you can see that the type of uh, approaches that I have explained that what is exactly needed to increase the performance that remains same. So, single world carbon nanotube to and interweave with uh, iron oxide Fe 3 O 4 or coat Fe 3 O 4 on aligned CNT scaffold. So, if you do that, then in the first case as you can see rate performance is grossly increased. Then this composite, this type of composite uh, exhibit a very high capacity about 1000 milliampere hour per gram recycling uh, effect more than 100. For commercial purpose, we need at least uh, 500 or more uh, charge discharge capability before the capacity fades uh, up to 85 percent, but uh, it is no way around, around 100. But people are limiting, you might have noticed people are limiting the capacity around 1000 because they know that they do not have the cathode material which is actually compatible with this kind of anode. So, they have limited this. For this type of thing, um, Fe 3 O 4 in aligned CNT, the capacity is 800 milliampere hour per gram with more than 100 cycles. So, now uh, we thought that uh, uh, let us uh, uh, work on uh, uh, another uh, oxide material. So, already we have worked on uh, zinc ferrite, uh, which I uh, in the in the last to last class as a case study we introduced uh, this thing so bismuth iron oxide uh, this is a multi component system uh, multi functional system so it is a multi ferroic material so it exhibits both polarization ordering and magnetization ordering it is a good photocatalytic material of course it is a good dielectric material so we thought that uh, why not to try it uh, if it qualifies for uh, uh, the um, negative electrode material for lithium as well as sodium ion battery. So, we tried both and eventually we found that um, both lithium and sodium uh, can be intercalated. Uh, it is not intercalation like because you know the reaction what goes on. It forms uh, uh, bismuth and iron particles separated in Li2O matrix and then it forms alloy with bismuth. So, that was our effort in the laboratory part of one of the PhD students work. And uh, you can see that A and C, they are the tip cast layer. So, we do it the tip casting, uh, the surface of the tip cast layer of bismuth iron oxide, uh, carbon blacks are there and it is bonded with a PBDF and then we coated it on uh, copper substrate. So, this is not that good because a lot of disintegration is there even in the virgin state. Now, porous layer was formed by electrophoretic deposition. This also you have seen in case of zinc ferrite, this EPD electrophoretic deposition uh, was found quite, quite effective. So, that uh, was coated and you can see almost uh, very uniform structure that we could get. Then uh, we did the charge discharge measurement. And uh, you can see here that uh, this is basically a, a, a two phase mixture is uh, forming. So, there are a lot of plateaus here, which is uh, which you can see. Um, uh, and first, uh, this material 
as you can understand that uh, lithium will come inside and form uh, this uh, alloy material. So, first the discharge operation will be there followed by the charge operation. So, the Coulombic efficiency is not that great, discharge capacity was uh, much higher as compared to the charge capacity. So, the Coulombic efficiency was not that great, but once you try to cycle it more and more, then initial this Coulombic capacity, Coulombic uh, deficiency what was there that was grossly reduced and then finally around 450, uh, which is not that bad capacity if you consider the cathode capacity maximum, even if in LMR type of uh, uh, cathode is 300 milli ampere hour per gram. So, it is higher than uh, your uh, graphite and uh, this will also serve the purpose we thought. And this is the rate performance, so starting from a very low level of current, if you progressively go to very high level of current, then many of the reaction as you can understand that this is not, uh, uh, it is too fast for this reaction to take place, because it is a bulky reaction you can imagine, that is not like the layered material and lithium is going in and coming out. But this is uh, quite complicated reactions, because uh, initially it forms uh, a metal nanoparticle and then uh, uh, it forms an alloy. So, if it, you can do it very fast, uh, so rate performance is not that great and that has been shown here, that if you have uh, a, a capacity around uh, 450, so the drain current is about 100 uh, milli ampere hour per gram the capacity is higher and then it progressively, but still it performs progressively drop down to about 150 and again you go back to lower current, then again uh, you get uh, a quite stable capacity. So, uh, the performance uh, uh, of course, it was published, uh, but performance is not that great, but I, I was tempted to introduce uh, our own uh, data. Uh, in the, this part of the lecture just to show you. And in fact, as a part of your uh, uh, homework, you can uh, start to uh, correlate the type of reaction that is going on uh, in this uh, uh, each case. And uh, I have shown certain example, if you take this discharge capacity and then uh, basically you do a differential capacity plot and this differential capacity plot uh, from first cycle and fifth cycle, you see that there is some change. So, the intense uh, uh, reduction peak that you can see at 1.4 volt, that is probably due to the reduction of bismuth in BFO lattice. So, it is the formation of bismuth and uh, what we did, we stopped the reaction here and then we test it. Uh, and uh, it is barely crystalline, if it is not very crystalline, then uh, it is difficult to identify whether it is really bismuth, but it shows some signature and also it is in the nano range. So, you will not get a very sharp peak out of it, but the peak position of bismuth that fairly matches uh, with this uh, formation. So, we assigned this peak at 1.4 volt is due to the reduction of bismuth. Reduction peak approximately, which is a 0 volt, that is due to the reduction of iron to metallic iron, because in bismuth iron oxide, it is not a single uh, element like bismuth, uh, like tin oxide. Uh, it is bismuth is there, uh, iron is there, so that is transformed into metallic iron. And this small hump, which you can see about uh, 1.7, probably that indicates the formation of lithium oxide. And uh, bismuth, uh, as we know, that it forms an alloy with uh, lithium. So, this 0.9 volt and 0.6 volt, these two peak 0 0.6 and 0 0.9, it will form uh, the alloy with bismuth um, material, uh, it forms the alloy. And the rough composition is lithium bismuth and Li3 Bi. And the oxidation peak uh, is uh, the D uh, alloying. So, oxidation peak at 1.7 volt uh, and oxidation peak uh, that is due to bismuth and 2.1 is the oxidation of uh, iron oxide. And this oxidation peak at 0.9 uh, is actually a one step 
delithiation. So, this will be delithiated in one step or even if it is in two step, it is very difficult to identify it. Now, if you uh, keep on cycling this material, then all these reactions are occurring uh, although at, at reduced intensity. So, that tells that these are reversible in nature. So, this uh, actually follows our own understanding about this conversion type of anode material. So, uh, the book uh, edited by Zhang, uh, this is important page number 97 to 105, uh, you can um, get uh, sufficient examples and uh, some of the things that I have covered in my lectures, you will find it. And for uh, this bismuth oxide, uh, we as I told that already we published the paper. So, if you are interested to know more about bismuth iron oxide, then uh, please have a look, uh, read this uh, paper as well, which is published in materials today communication. So, in this particular lecture, we talked about capacity issues of negative electrodes, then major problem of metal alloy anode uh, including the volume expansion, the pulverization, the delamination, then to circumvent this problem 2D and 1D uh, structured anode and what, it, what are their implications, how they work and why they are um, helping to improve the properties that have been talked about. And then we talked about silicon based anode, the size effect issue that uh, I have described, metal oxide anode we have introduced and what is their actual, um, actual uh, mechanism of uh, um, this operation and finally, BFO as a case study that we have talked about in this lecture. Thank you for your attention.